All right, so I can unmute myself. That's handy. So you can mute everybody, and if somebody actually wants to speak, they can just unmute themselves. Um, are we sharing screen, and is the sizzle reel intended to be on someone's screen, or? Um, I was thinking that uh, we could do that, yeah, uh, right here very shortly in about 10 minutes or so, maybe a little less, and then uh, we can have that go for a little bit. But I was actually thinking, Camus, if you were able to say uh, a few words in regards to, you know, um, how we typically charge uh, ticket sales for events. Uh, this obviously yeah. is free and open to anyone, but yeah. uh, in order to continue with programming, you know, a, a a donation, if possible, would be very kind, but uh, it's not necessary. But at that time, it might be nice to, um, you know, give a shout out to all of our participants and all of our sponsors, if that's cool with you. And then I can bring that page up. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's up there. Um... And you want this to be done at the beginning, right? Um, well, I was thinking uh, we would do, I would do a little program intro. Hello, everyone. Um, Garrett could do an intro history to ADF. Uh, he should be playing some tunes here in a little bit. And then uh, perhaps you would go then with uh, a shout out to the sponsors and- um, They're planning the meeting. And so on and so forth. <laughs> Does that sound like a plan? Oh. Or do you want yeah, to do it in the beginning? Good. Yeah, beginning is fine. Um, Miss Judith Bertner, is that Garrett Bertner's mom? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, we hear you. Okay. I thought I heard someone. Hello. Hi, Garrett's Hi. mom. Hello. <laughs> You're all getting a peek under the hood here as we figure out how to do this. Yeah, I don't see my picture, so I'm not quite with it either. <laughs> you should be able um, to hit start video if you oh, want us to be yeah. able to see you. Oh. Yeah, on the bottom oh. left. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you um, go. Les is here too. Hi, Les. Hi. Hi. Oh, and Garrett's here. Yeah. Garrett audio, we're not hearing. Hmm? There you go. Um, Chad, I was wondering, do you want to test drive at least the share screen um, for the sizzle reel and make sure that? I'm yeah, I'm sure. up, yeah, I'm pulling that up right now. Just trying to get uh, full screen here. I feel like there's a way the presenter has like the main screen screen usually and then it's like the big screen. Um, it's a speaker view. Yeah, I guess you have to get a speaker view. I'll just turn it. Do you get the sponsor oh. page now? There you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. There's Garrett. How's it going, man? There we go. Garrett, you might be muted. Here, maybe. Um, Can you unmute him? Can yeah, I? Garrett, we got you. Are you unable to unmute oh, yourself? No, we hear it. We hear it. Hey, I was. Uh, it was picking up some other device. I'm here. Hey, how's it going? Good. 
What are we doing? Just waiting? We're just, uh, yeah, just kind of getting uh, acquainted, getting um, screens uh, sharing set up and kind of getting our bearings straight here for the next little bit. Are you wanting to, yeah. we can unmute a few people that aren't necessarily needed and were you willing to uh, give us some nice intro tunage? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, no, that'd be kind of fun and exciting for sure. All right, just whenever we're done set, setting up, I'll play Right on, yeah, yeah. You ready for elevator music? Cool. Yes, please. <laughs> don't even have our microphone up there. 
microphone. I mean that thing up there. The picture thing? Yeah. I can probably see this. Yeah, we'll just give everyone a few more minutes to get logged in, settled in, do their quarantine, what have you, and then uh, we'll get rolling here. A little three minute ditty. Okay, yeah, you got it. All right. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks, Garrett. That's fantastic. <laughs> we'll give a virtual round of applause to uh, Mr. Garrett Bertner uh, for kicking things off in a lovely way this evening. Um, thank you all for joining us for the inaugural first ever uh, quarantine edition uh, virtual lecture series uh, for the Alaska Design Forum. Uh, looks like we have a, a pretty good show up. So I uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time. And we're super excited about this opportunity. I want to really extend a, a, a big thanks to Nathan Schaefer. He was very much a, a spearheader of this uh, opportunity. And um, we were set up to have, you know, our typical spring lecture series where we have three individuals uh, scattered throughout the spring. He was the second uh, in our lineup and uh, I guess it was within a week or so of uh, his lecture time we made the decision. Uh, the board decided it was best if we went ahead and canceled uh, for now or I should say postponed. Um, and Nathan was intent on continuing the conversation and trying different avenues. So um, a, a big thanks to him for, for pulling this off. And um, uh, as far as revised utopias and the uh, whole scope of, of this season, um, the, the design forum has really wanted to, you know, investigate and, and seek unconventional voices in our community and test different discussion formats and try to create more of a dialogue. So this is something that's been, you know, the, the, the seed was planted long ago and just for the sake of current events, you know, it, things are kind of unfolding in a trajectory that we wanted to explore anyway. So um, we uh, are really excited about this opportunity. Unfortunately, it's under these circumstances, uh, uh, as far as health concerns, but you know the design form really is interested in in trying different outlets, uh, different venues, different ways in which we can actually create a forum and create a dialogue. So as we move forward this evening, um, we do want to open it up to our audience, and we'd like to have more of a reciprocal Q and A that's ongoing. Um, we would like to monitor it and keep it a little bit more in check, though. Um, so if you guys could please, um, if you could please just raise your hand um, and we will try and, and address questions as they come in. Um, perhaps we can kind of group them together and uh, we can, um, no peanut gallery. <laughs> And hopefully we can um, and field your questions and Nathan can can uh, do a little bit of ongoing Q&A there. That would be fantastic. So um, without any further ado here, um, you know, with Revised Utopia and, and trying different formats and, and uh, different ways of doing discussions, you know, we're wanting to investigate uh, the narrative on cultural progress and the way it's continually rewritten. And should the role of design be moving from creation to repair? Is there a place for optimism in emerging visions of the future? And how might the long history of utopias in our arts and culture affect our current conception of good design? So in 2020, ADF aims to initiate an engaged conversation with our community, inviting all voices to the table. And with Revised Utopias, we'll be exploring new lecture formats and events that invite the audience to participate in the discussion. So moving forward um, and some of the programming, we're having to reinvent things and shuffle and kind of stay light footed. Um, but that's, I think, where we shine uh, as a community uh, of designers and, and creative thinkers. So uh, we're still trying to move forward with some of our programs. They might have to adapt and switch a little bit, uh, but I think thing, good things are coming ahead. Um, so what I would like to do is turn things over to Mr. Garrett Bertner, who uh, serenaded us in the beginning here uh, with lovely music. And uh, he is also the president of the Alaska Design Forum. 
And um, so, yeah, I would love it if he could just share with us a little bit of the history and some of the intent. He's the longest residing board member, so uh, he has a really good pulse on how things are going. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, I guess to the to the history side, uh, this is definitely a new thing for ADF, and as you mentioned, we we had sought to explore new new venues and new techniques with this lecture season, but it took a, a pretty radical act of God to uh, to push us in that direction a little more aggressively than we maybe had uh, planned to. Um, so this is very new for us. Um, but I, I really want to thank, you know, Chad and Nathan in particular for for seeing the opportunity and, and jumping out there um, to make this happen in, in short order. Um, I think a lot of us are caught flat-footed right now, um, trying to transition our our routines and our lives, and um, and so just thinking about doing um, more educational programming was, you know, not the first thing on everyone's mind, maybe, but it is, uh, I think, really, really valuable and appreciated um, by all of us and in the community. Um, I, I don't have a lot of prepared remarks, but one thing that has come up um, for me in the last two weeks is just thinking about how fortunate uh, those of us in the design world are to uh, to thrive on on our sort of interior interior um, dialogues and our in our creative process, um, and I think you know we can find both um, both kind of distraction or entertainment in that and courage and hopefully um, community with one another. Um, so yeah, I guess my message would be one of uh, courage through creativity. Um, I'm really glad you're all here tonight and I'm gonna pass the mic to, do we wanna talk to Aaron or Camus first? I think we'll go uh, to Camus. Camus, would you mind? Um sharing a bit in regards to some of our um, sponsorships and such. Uh, I mean, yep. Yep, you there? Um, so I am the uh, treasurer. Um, I mean, we all kind of do a lot of everything, right? But um, technically, um, I, my job is to kind of make sure that we are, we are breaking even. We're a nonprofit. So our year end goal is to make sure that we're not in the negative. Um, so kind of just sharing, I mean, I guess this, this whole digital presentation format kind of changes how the, the kind of financing of it kind of works. Um, historically we've been grant funded about a third, uh, we've been sponsored about a third and then another third, um, was through ticket sales and, uh, fundraising events. So it was kind of a nice, um, you know, win-win-win situation. Um, in this case, uh, it was really important for us for this to be accessible to everyone, um, given that, you know, some people might uh, not be employed or, um, and it was also kind of an experiment. So we wanted to make it as accessible as possible. So it was very intentional that this event is free. Um, that being said, uh, were it to be kind of a, uh, typical lecture, uh, we would have a $15 admission um, that we would collect at the door and that kind of supports the, the, the third of the, the organization. So I guess um, this is kind of a little bit of an ask, but um, if you are um, able to, um, if you can uh, donate, I will send a link right now in the chat window. And if you want to donate $10 or if you want to donate $20 or $15, I think um, that is great. But as we experiment with this format, um, we kind of have to also make sure the, the kind of bottom line evens out. Um, so that's my kind of boring treasure uh, spiel. Um, I love the programming. This is why we're really involved. Um, the board is also very invested in it um, personally, time-wise, um, and a lot of um, the board members have also donated. So there's a lot of people that support it uh, to keep it going. And I think it's really powerful that, that we keep it going um, despite the consequences uh, of the current situation. Um, we're not shutting down. So 
thanks to thanks to Garrett and and um, Aaron and Chad for kind of keeping the energy going. All right, thanks, Camus. Appreciate that. So, um, yeah, we want to bring this to everyone. You know, obviously uh, free and it's very experimental. But if you can help out, it would help out our future programming. Um, and that would be fantastic. So everyone's here to talk with and hear about Nathan Schaefer's projects. And uh, I got to, like I said, for those that are just now tuning in, uh, he's been really a, a fundamental driver in this program for this evening. So a big thanks to him. Uh, so here in a little bit, once I turn things over, I will make sure everyone's cameras are turned off and we'll just have uh, Nathan be a full screen. If you guys would please just uh, use the chat window or somehow reach out and we can field questions uh, at certain times. So thanks again. And uh, a little bit about Nathan here. Uh, Nathan Schaefer is a new media artist from Alaska specializing in augmented reality and digital humanities. He is one of the founding members of both the Meme Writer Media Team an art collective founded in 2000 designing early form internet memes and Manifest AR, the first international art collective making augmented reality works. He was profiled by PBS Digital Studios as part of an online collaboration called The Future in 2014. And Schaefer's geo-based AR works have been displayed on every continent. His work has been shown at Noxious Sector Projects, Unseen Sculptures, the Bunnell Street Art Center, Rhizome, ISEA, the Pratt Museum, and the Virtual Switzerland, Out North Contemporary Art House, and the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. He's also contributed chapters to the first anthology of AR-based art making, Augmented Reality Art, published by Springer in 2014 and Augmented Reality Games, published in 2019, and Augmented Reality in Education, forthcoming in 2020. He just recently received a Creative Capital Award in 2020 for his Winter Moot Project, a limited series of augmented reality comic books set in an alternate history, Alaska. So we're gonna hear a little bit from Nathan uh, in regards to Revised Utopias, his take on it, and how his projects overlap with our theme. So Nathan, are you, uh, are you alive and well here? I am alive and well. Thank you very much, Chad. That was uh, quite an introduction. Thank you. And uh, thank you for everybody, or to everybody, for being here. This is a really, I think, fun um, way to do this. And I think it would be a good addition to the three cities, even though I've not done the three Alaskan cities with you guys before, but I'm imagining uh, one of these setups might be kind of fun, especially for international travelers. And I noticed in all the participants that I see lots of people I know from literally all over the world, which is really cool to see them coming in to something on Alaskan time instead of us always going to New York or LA time. Um, and uh, I don't know who came up with the idea of revised utopias, but it's incredible as a topic to get a bunch of artists and architects and engineers thinking about. And when the design forum came to me and said that that was going to be the new theme for their year's worth of programming, it was actually pretty exciting. And I knew immediately what I would want to talk about because of it, and it's the Dirigibles of Denali project, which was started, I think, about four or five years ago. And what the Dirigibles of Denali project does is it looked at three of these proposals for what we call dome cities, but really they're just futuristic metropolises that were proposed in Alaska in the 60s and 70s, and it's mostly in the 70s. So they have this retro futuristic aesthetic that we attribute to them. So they're um, what William Gibson would have called ray gun gothic. That's uh, it's a style of architecture that's set in the future, but it's also drawing significantly from the past. And when we look at it in that lens of retro futurism, what we see is an imagined future from the past. And in this case, it was 
built around these cities that never existed. And so there was three of them in Alaska. Uh, chronologically, the first one is Arctic City by an architect named Fry Otto. Uh, the second one chronologically is Seward Success, which was designed by Tandy Industries in 68. And then Denali City, which was designed by Mike Gravel, who was Senator at the time in 72. So I am gonna go to sharing my screen with you so we could just look at these images while everything is going on. Um, so for the dirigibles of Denali project, uh, I used augmented reality to, or I used a 3D modeling system to create the cities and then using geolocative augmented reality, I put the cities basically on location on where they were originally designed. Now, anybody who's done any sort of AR work in Alaska knows that we have a lot of significant things that affect the way augmented reality works in a geolocative sense. And that's, we're at the top of the world. So satellites don't go straight up and down with our, um, our Wi-Fi connection. So it's really hard to get something precise in an up and down situation. The other thing that we have going for, or that we don't have going for us is that we don't have a whole lot of Wi-Fi connectivity and that the earth is round, oddly enough. So when we have that much error on geolocative AR, especially large pieces, they might be a mile to a half mile off every time. I know that was kind of a technical thing to talk about, but I'm gonna show you some images of Arctic City. This is what it looked like in the modeler based on the designs by Fry Otto. Now he did 3D, mod or he actually built 3D constructions of this. Uh, it was a city that was designed for the Arctic based on a former design he had for an Antarctic based city. Uh, this is Seward Success. Seward Success had a really beautiful little proposal with some mapping and a lot of uh, designed spots. In the first proposal, it was really just this front section here that had a layout for the city's design. And then over the years, it would have created uh, three more sections that all sort of interconnected with this. And this big tower here is called the Petroleum Center, which would have been a, a, a skyline. So this is we call this a dome city, but it's not actually dome city. What it is, is a series of interconnected buildings where you could enter the city and stay inside from one end of the city to the other through a series of um, moving escalators and sidewalks and things like that. Um, Seward Success, here I'm gonna go back. Seward Success was a very popular city when it was designed. It really captured the imagination of a lot of people in the US for a couple of different reasons, which I'll get to soon. But um, people were familiar with this image and it, it kind of got people talking. And I really connected with Seward's success because of the internet and people making these lists like the 10 best cities that were never built or whatever. And when I saw Alaska there, it kind of triggered this idea for me to do this. So Seward Success was actually going to be built on Point McKinsey, which is right across from Anchorage. This is going to be a futuristic city two miles from Anchorage. Um, the, the most bizarre one in the group, though, was Denali City by Senator Mike Gravel. Um, there's a whole lot of history in this, but basically there was a bad fire in Denali National Park, and it took down a building, and they were going to rebuild the building. And then Gravel kind of did a feasibility study and decided that there was a spot that would actually be a good place to build a winter wonderland city. And he wanted to use this technology that was actually designed by Fry Otto, the guy who made Arctic City, which was these uh, Teflon drapes that would have gone over a city. And th they could have been see-through, like a lot of the stuff, uh, Fry Otto did this in the Munich Olympics, he made um, see-through Teflon drapes. But what this would have done in the city is it would have created basically um, like a carport effect over the city. So it could have been negative 40 outside 
but inside the city under the drapes, the frost would have been minimized and it still would have been winter, but it would have been a negotiable winter. And this city was designed to be built right on the Tokusitna River, looking exactly at the Tokusitna Glacier. And then if you looked up on a clear day, you would get a good uh, scene of Denali. So this is the, the first book. And we did several books for this project. And we looked at sort of the historiography of Alaska in this context. And this article right here called Closer Than We Think was published in Chicago right after Alaska became a state. And the illustration here is of a dome city with airships going into the city. And this was kind of sweeping the nation at the time that Yes, Alaska was now part of the United States. And yes, we're gonna be doing all sorts of economic things there. But the problem is it's super cold. So how are we normal folk gonna to go to Alaska and do a bunch of business? And their solution was this polar city that was encased in a dome and could keep like a nice environment inside that people were more familiar with, like a European normal, lower 48 normal environment or a tropical environment. And then we would airship stuff in. So this was the thinking at the time in the 50s and the 60s coming into it. Now, when you look at the history of dome cities, the first thing I did was I asked myself, what was the first dome city? Where, where was it? Who thought of it? And the answer ended up being very strange. It was invented in the 1800s by a white supremacist science fiction author named Willem DeLees Hayes. And he wrote a book called 300 Years Hence, which is the first mention of a dome city. And in this book, there was a big apocalypse that happened and it started wiping off all of humanity. And this brave band of people, white people, decided to build an underwater dome city uh, in the, un the bottom of the ocean. And that's where a bunch of white people went and wrote out the apocalypse. And that was the first mention of a dome city, which was kind of shocking to me. And then I started thinking about it in relationship to something like this polar city. And the, there is a similarity between those in a colonial settler sense. And then there's a similarity between those cities and those pictures you see of like mission to Mars, we're gonna colonize Mars. These dome cities in a context of Alaska were the fantasies of people who were wanting to colonize what they saw as the great white north or all those horribly cliche things we, we hear now, the north to the future kind of thing. And they came up and we can actually see this play out in real time. There's buildings like outside of uh, Kaktovik on Barter Island where the military would go and they would build these buildings and they would be these insular buildings where they would keep all their personnel in there and give them a like European equivalent environments. And this amazing thing happened where no matter how much European equivalent, lower 48 equivalent you gave in the buildings, the people who were there still suffered from the same seasonal effective things. And without fail, almost every one of these little buildings that were put up by the military industrial complex all over the Arctic, they would end up trying to make friends with the local uh, Nupiat people to get through the winter. Um, so the people that were living just fine on the outside of this building were thriving, in fact, had this amazing, uh, amazingly rich visual, uh, linguistic storytelling culture were kind of helping these high-tech military people negotiate this life in the Arctic. So I'm gonna get back to that in a, a second because I wanna look at some of these other cities and what we did. So when we built these cities in AR, I wrote a history of the cities and I did like a little historical analysis and talked about a lot of different philosophies and literary theory. Um, but then I realized that there was more to it that I needed to do. And one of those was I wanted to see more fiction. Like I was doing a lot of historical recreation and um, like history writing. So uh, the team that was doing that, uh, spearheaded by me, we hired 10 Alaskan authors to write science fiction set in the cities. 
and every one of them were, weren't given like these super specific things. They were just told these are the three cities that were proposed in Alaska. You know, go ahead and write fiction as if the cities had been built. And I was really expecting them to catch on to this idea of colonialism and this outreach of a monoculture into the northern regions by displacing their biome in Alaska, the same way we would, we would displace a, an earth biome on Mars to live, or the way we displace a, a biome into a submarine to survive under that. Like I, I saw them thinking that survival was only contingent on whatever was normal for them. But without fail, the amazing thing about these Alaskan authors was that when they thought of a dome city, they weren't thinking with an imagination from the 1970s. They were thinking of an imagination from the 2010s. And in the 2010s, global warming had impacted the planet on a mega scale. And for us in the North and for Alaskans, global warming is something we can see. We, we know villages, we know people that are impacted very significantly by this warming. We could see it when we go pick berries. We can see it for those of us that go uh, visit glaciers on the regular. We, some of us remember what Exit Glacier looked like in the 70s and 80s. And so Alaska, the authors had kind of internalized this deep connection to global warming and didn't see dome cities as a colonial extension. What they saw was a dome city as an archeological structure that could preserve an environment that was being stolen from them. So most of the authors created, uh, I wouldn't say it was utopian fiction, but it would be dystopian or post-apocalyptic fiction. Some of them, which that's not the right term, but um, in the far future, these dome cities, how would they function? And uh, a lot of times it was to keep plants or animals or maintain a, a, a cold environment. Sometimes it was to uh, maintain cultures of the cold. Vivian Faith Prescott wrote this amazing story where uh, inside of Seward Success, they had all these, it's basically like um, a zoo of all the Arctic cultures that were kind of placed together in these people from all these different cultures were, were living there, but they were being preserved more or less in this dome. So this collection of um, science fiction, um, it was just, it was so rich and beautiful and it was gonna be part of the original project and we just decided to make um, its own book. So these are two downloads that uh, we've made available for any of anybody that wants to read them uh, inside of the links. The, um, get back to one of these other projects. There was three other books that we published um, for this show at the Pratt Museum. I'm gonna show you one of them right now. So inside uh, Denali City, Mike Gravel, he proposed Denali City but there was this thing that happened uh, while he was Senator right before he proposed in Ali city that ruined it from the beginning. And that was, he went against the wishes of the Democrats at the time and worked with Republicans to get the Alaska pipeline built. And when the Alaska pipeline got built without the approval of the Democrats, he became um, a persona non grata. So when he started proposing Denali city, Nobody wanted him to succeed. So the only mentions you could find in media, specifically newspapers that mentioned Denali City, are basically people completely trouncing the idea of it. Um, and one of the biggest ones was this article in Juno called Gravel Proposes McKinley Bubble, which is what we named uh, the third book in this series. The reason we did that is because the only place we could find actual information on Denali City was in the Gravel Archive at UAF. It's in a basement, it's in two boxes, and you gotta wear archive gloves to go through them. Inside this, the, the Denali City Archive, there are literally no images of what the city would have looked like. 
there are feasibility studies. There are images of Fry Otto's work. There's images of Arctic City. There's images of mining cities. There's all these images of other projects, but there was nothing other than one map and a couple little feasibility studies of what it would have looked like with sort of proof of, of concept of the drape structures. So uh, for the Pratt show, I, it, it might have been a little artistic aside, but I was, I think I was a little uh, angry with the archive that I didn't have an image to work backwards from. Um, I'll talk about how I made the city, but I ended up publishing archive notes from the entire archive, but everything that was even closely uh, resembling an image, so even lines or graphics, I took every aspect of imagery out and I created what are basically, they look just like uh, concrete poems. But this is all the notes that would have comprised the notion, comprised the notion of Denali City. Um, so these would have been maps from the area that talked about where it was in location. Uh, and at the show, uh, the museum show at the Pratt, the augmented reality actually worked to bring the imagery up and all these basically concrete poems were printed and placed in the gallery. So this one right here is actually the site location map, which is the one I had to use to design the city. So they had these nine spots where they were gonna dig boreholes right next to the river. So I used those to build up a city and then kind of did it. The amazing thing with this though, is I was actually talking with Mike Gravel during this whole process. Uh, I interviewed him for the first book and it took me a long time to put it all together. And when I finally put it together and sent it over to him, he almost immediately was like, this isn't what I was wanting to do. Uh, kind of sent me on my way, but I'd already built like so much of the city uh, inside of it and it matched perfectly with what the archive was. And I told him, this is what the notes say. Um, and I didn't want to get into an argument with, you know, but this is what I, I researched and, I, I don't know if you remember all of this, but his memory was like so incredibly good when I would talk to him. Uh, he was so fast and he just remembered people's names, like first name, last name, kind of how old they were and where they were from, what kind of accent. Like he just recalled these things from the, the 60s and 70s without any sort of uh, stuttering or thinking time. So I, I honestly couldn't keep up with him while we were talking. So this is the third book in that series, which is also uh, available as a link. Um, Looks like we had a question. Uh, the fourth one we did was just a recreation of the Seward success. In this one, uh, it was, there was two copies of the proposal for Seward success in existence. So I just grabbed them and uh, did a digital rec recreation of the way they actually looked and then had them printed uh, with everything inside of them. The other books in the series, with a couple of them we didn't actually print. The other one was a collection of poetry, which is this odd thing connected to collaborative fiction inside of that. Um, I'm feeling long-winded and I want to kind of get a sense of what other people are thinking about this, but I want to say uh, when this project kind of ended, it ended mostly in that fictional world where we were working with science fiction authors and uh, creating augments based on that. And then it got into this really interesting idea of collaborative storytelling, uh, which oddly enough mimics the way things are going on now. But since all of our people were scattered across Alaska and we couldn't ever really get together, we did everything on Facebook. We had a Facebook group where we were constantly talking to each other about this is the kind of thing I'm going to do with my fiction. This is the kind of thing I got to do. And everybody had created th like these huge stories that kind of interconnected with each other. Um, and it kind of turned into this collaborative fiction. So several of the stories inside of the omnibus were written by several different people, uh, assuming different names or, or whatever. And one of these fictional characters ended up writing a poetry book, which was like just this odd aside that happened mm -hmm. at the end. And uh, once the project concluded, I actually started a comic book project that in my mind at the time, was completely unrelated. It was uh, working with like superheroes in, in Alaska. And then when I was working on some of the story for one of the superheroes, I just set her inside of Arctic City and 
kind of became this perfect match. So I started calling up the people that I had been working with for the Dirigibles project. And we started this whole new comic book series, which um, is available on Comixology. We got it up on websites and stuff as well. I'm gonna stop this share right now. <laughs> so do we have any questions uh, for all the participants out there on, on this uh, section? Uh, of Nathan's presentation. Thank you, Nathan, for that. I appreciate it. Um, I find it really uh, amazing that you went through this uh, old archive and found the, the Seward success uh, kind of buried. And then you went and talked to uh, Gravel and he was like, no, nah, this is nothing like what I was thinking. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I, I misspoke. He did have two little napkin drawings that he drew himself that are amazing. And I don't have the rights to them at the moment. Um, and one of the cool things he did, which is why it was kind of exciting that you had mentioned the Anchorage Museum, which I guess you guys use pretty regular for these. Uh, he got the inspiration for Denali City looking at that painting by Sidney Lawrence in the Anchorage Museum that's just a picture of Denali from the Toka Sitna. So inside the notes, there was all these pictures of that painting and the, the downtown section of Denali City was supposed to be right where that painting was set from the viewpoint that that painting was gonna be Denali in the city. So I, it took a little bit of figuring out where that was using Google Earth, but um, we actually centered it right there. Wow. So we have a couple of questions uh, that just came in and uh, I want to invite anyone else to post their questions in the, the chat space and we'll pass them along to Nathan. Um, looks like Will Schendel was wondering what were the projected populations of these cities? Do you have thoughts on that? I do. I'm going to show you what they were. Uh, inside of the three dumb cities. Sorry to rock it through. No, yeah. Um, the Anchorage Museum actually wouldn't give me permission to print the Sydney Lawrence. This is a, a version I did of that myself in pixels. Um, so this is a, a long book and we kind of published it the way a middle school science textbook would look with all these extra things. But at the end, we have uh, a look at all the different cities with some very specific uh, concepts. So Arctic City, oh, I didn't even mention this. Every one of these cities was actually just part one, which is this amazing thing. The Arctic City was meant to be daisy chained. So every one of these domes was supposed to house about 50,000 people inside a very small section of the city. This is from above. This is where the 50,000 residents would have mostly lived. And then on these corridors on the outside, and it would have been, uh, like farmland and stuff in the middle. But the biggest I saw was about 14 daisy chain dome cities that each housed about 50,000 in uh, his estimates. There was also like some airship stuff. The city was nuclear powered, which speaks a lot to like when he designed it. Um, Seward success was about 20,000 in part one here, just like in Arctic City. Uh, each of the successive ones would have housed another 20,000. And the way I kind of figured Seward's success is that it was basically like this hyper mall where people could live there, but it was just this crazy interior city. So tons of malls, inside gardens, gazebos, all that kind of stuff. And Denali City was quite a bit smaller. They only guessed at its top, it would house about 2,000 people that lived there year round. The way Denali City was designed was to be a winter wonderland where literally people from all over the world would come there. It would be a huge tourist hub for Alaska in the winter, which is a totally different way of us really thinking about that. Because we do have like Girdwood, but Gravel was proposing a city that does not exist in the world. A, a, a city that's at, you know, negative 50 degrees everybody is still coming here by the hundreds. And 
it was also a Carlos city. The way he was going to get people there was from a high tech maglev train, like magnetic levitation train that was coming in from Anchorage. And he proposed a dirigible plot sub, so, uh, airship airport in Talkeetna that using airships or dirigibles would bring people into Denali city. Uh, and it was that section of the Gravel archive on Denali city that we used to name the project. Hey, uh, Nathan, we have a few more coming in. Uh, I appreciate everybody touching base here. So one question from uh, Mr. Garrett Bertner was curious about the various ways that augmented reality was implemented in these projects. Um, and maybe if you'll think about that just for one moment, uh, what I'd like, uh, while everyone's tuned in here, I'm sure people will be departing uh, as they need to, but if you guys are visiting us and participating from outside of Alaska or outside from our three core cities where we do our in-person lecture series, which is Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau. We would love it if you would just uh, type where you're from. Uh, we're curious to see if we're able to reach out further from those three cities. We'd really love to reach out to uh, the far regions of Alaska. Um, and we're really excited to hear about others from uh, elsewhere as well. So please uh, drop us a line. Uh, that would be fantastic. One other thing uh, before people may decide to take off is uh, Nathan has been super kind and super generous and has shared uh, digitally links to um, all of these books. Um, so I've posted that in the chat and it is all a link for that in the chat and there's also a link provided in our Facebook event. So uh, if you are so curious, uh, please do have a look and uh, and check those out. So thank you very much, Nathan, for that. And so, yeah, let's hear about uh, different ways that augmented reality was implemented in your projects. That's an awesome question. Uh, a million different ways. So the first one we did was the geolocative augmented reality where we built the 3D model, we put it up on location. But the problem with that is unless you are one of the few people that wants to go to uh, the Tokusitna River, which is very hard to get to that exact location and look at an AR project in person, the likelihood of people doing that was very little. Maybe a little, a few more people would go to Kotzebue and look at Arctic City, which is built on the peninsula right next to it. And even more people would go to Seward Success and look at that in 3D. But Again, where we are on the earth, it, the tilt was off. So we had to change it up and we had to fix photos to make them accurate when we did the geolocating. Um, so that was how we did it. And then when we published the books, we actually used a kind of augmented reality called target-based. And that's where we put digital information on top of an image via a computer. So that means you open up the book and with your smart device, you go with the app open, you scan over the book and different augments would pop up. So other 3D models, videos on the science fiction omnibus, we had the authors reading their stories. Uh, I use AR a lot for um, language work. So there's so many languages in Alaska uh, that we, the AR we use to translate whatever that language is and to say English or to we, for us to explain what that word actually means because there's no equivalent in English, what it might look like in relationship to other Alaskan languages. Um, and then we had another form of AR. So in the museum show, we had this big empty space that was just an empty pedestal. And one of the guys I went to grad school with, this amazing artist named Christopher Manzione, um, runs a project with moving image out of New York and Istanbul called Activator. And Activator is this AR app the pioneered this thing of just placing augments the way Adobe Aero works right now. Uh, but a, a few years ago, Christopher took the cities and with these iPads in the museum, you would just hold up the iPad, tap on the screen where the big empty spot was and the city would appear in that spot and you could interact with it in that way. So that was the three different ways we use augmented reality in the project. So uh, another question here, and we have quite a few rolling in. I really appreciate it, everyone. So uh, when Alaska debated moving the state capital Willow to Willow, was there uh, ever like a utopian plan for that or um, relocating that throughout the state? Do you know of anything? 
I do. Uh, the main history of it, the only reason I know about it is there is this architectural magazine out of Germany called Bauwelt. Bauwelt a few years ago did an issue on unbuilt um, utopia. Maybe it wasn't utopias, unbuilt cities or whatever. So they asked me to do something with Seward Success, which I had done way before I did Arctic City and Denali City. But Bauwelt did an article on Seward Success and the AR aspect of it. And then they were like, do you know this guy, this other Alaskan named George Canellos? And I said, I have no idea who that is, but Canelo's right before our article on Seward Success, he had written a history of Alaska City, which was the proposed capital for Alaska that was going to be built right north of Willow. So uh, inside of Bauvelt, I want to say this was like five, six years ago, there's an article George Canellos wrote. I have a copy of it somewhere. I don't know if George would be okay with me sharing it with you. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he keeps it up on his website. Um, it's actually a really amazing city the way it was proposed, but it was um, it was it was a regular city. It wasn't like a a space age city. It was more of a practical. The capital should be on the road system kind of project. I got gotcha. you. So um, another uh, fun question here is where do the when when or where do the dirigibles come into play? Um, uh, Sue Sprinkle has heard discussion about using them in the future, maybe to move, move freight or using them uh, for mining, uh, traveling. I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, where and when do they come into play within this scheme? And um, what are thoughts on, uh, you know, future adaptability perhaps or in futures as far as uh, transportation within here? Uh, so the dirigibles in connection to dome cities in Alaska have been there since the 50s. When the first Polar City article was published, the, the airships have been part of that. Uh, I didn't get into this much, but when you look at the historical nature of a dome city, when it first appeared in culture, it was in the 1800s, which is actually the same time frame that trains and airships appeared which we call that era, if we're in the context of literary punk or cyberpunk fiction, we call that steampunk, everything that's from that era. So a dome city, a blimp, or a, a dirigible, and a train are all part of this uh, steampunk aesthetic. So they've been connected for a really long time. We use the name of our project because of this note in the Gravel Archive in Denali City called Dirigibles for Denali. And it was just this feasibility study of building a dirigible airport in Talkeetna to bring tourists into Denali City. And as far as the future goes with that, uh, the comic books we have now, um, well, okay, so inside of the science fiction omnibus, the collective fiction that was written together was called Dirigibles, Dirigibles of Denali, was the name of those stories. But inside those stories, Dirigibles of Denali was an Alaskan reality TV show called Dearest Dribbles of Denali that followed four different airship crews that were trucking between all these dome cities in Alaska. Uh, that collaborative fiction turned into some of the Wintermoot comic books. So there's lots of airship crews and spaceship crews that are based on this idea of a dirigible. And we've kind of paired that with uh, the Ikiak as well in a Burnosphere. It's, it's a really complicated thing, but it, it, that going into the future, think of an airship the size of a Burnosphere in Proxima Centauri with uh, Alaskan superheroes stuck on it. So in a lot of utopian schemes and thinking about, you know, like situationist theories and um, um, future cities, you know, there's almost this, uh, prevailing anarchy uh, frame of mind anyway as far as freedom and people being able to have the space and the wherewithal and the time to basically you know uh, investigate creative pursuits and Laura Forbes has a question you know are there many actual uh, space like articulations of art design and culture in source materials like is there space for artists uh, and the like within these cities? 100% yes. I'm so glad you brought that up, Laura Forbes. 
uh, in the original proposal for sewage success is this image right here, which was looking into the interior of one of these living area malls. And if you can look, there's all this form line imagery like totem poles and stuff. Um, so I, I was about to start modeling some of these and something just kind of got stuck in my craw about this. So I went to my buddy, Benjamin Schleifman, and I showed him this image and I said, hey, uh, are these, you know, what do you think of this? What uh, are these something that if I recreated them, it would be a problem. And he was like, yeah, this is clan imagery. You know, oh, uh, this is a frog. This is a clan house, this belongs to a clan. Um, so we had a conversation, him and I together, and I said, I'm recreating the city, but I don't want to recreate that. How about, would you be interested in doing alternate public art projects inside of Seward Success instead of me recreating what come across today is like basically um, cultural appropriation. Uh, so Benjamin came up with these other images that are completely fine to have in public art spaces in these fictional cities. So he gave me schematics and I turned his schematics into 3D models and we placed them around the city. But there's lots of other spots inside of all these cities for art making, um, and that kind of thing. One of them being the, one of the fictional airline or airship pilots was also a, a, a very odd poet that worked into the story. So um, it, it got in a, a weird space where it was like these fictional cities with these fictional artists doing fictional things based on reality. And it just got fun to play with it. So, you know, with this idea of, um this disconnection or the shielding and protection uh, in creating a, a dreamy habitat, if you will, within these, uh, you know, it's either a domed or bubble city, or like you were saying, uh, with Seward Success, it's more of kind of a, you enter the system and it's a series of different traveling paths throughout uh, where you're kind of in a, in a secure environment. So there's very much this disconnect or disassociation with the actual surrounding landscape. And a uh, question has come up, you know, as far as, you know, within these schemes, how, is there any consideration for things like earthquakes? And I might expand on that, you know, as far as the Denali city being placed along like the Tokositna River, you know, these are ever shifting and changing and moving uh, landscapes. And so, I guess, do you have any comments on how, you know, that kind of like defensive or, you know, um, turning your back on the landscape, how that's kind of folded into a project or, you know, what's that, what's that dialogue like? Honestly, it's the same dialogue as I had at the beginning of the project, the outset, approaching it like uh, these colonial enclaves. And when you look at Arctic City, and, and nothing against Fry Otto. He was an amazing architect, architect. But when you look at Arctic City and when you look at Seward's success in the context of Alaska, uh, there was no contingency plan for actually living on significant Pacific fault lines where earthquakes happen, where volcanoes happen. Uh, there was just nothing put in place. The same can't be said for Denali City. Even with its lack of imagery to look at, all the feasibility studies were so meticulously gone over that they really did take things like earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, extreme temperatures into account. And they actually came up with these beautiful ways of dealing with it. And the, the reason that it happened is because it was designed by people who lived in Alaska. Like they were very well aware of what it's like to have a car under a carport when it's negative 30 degrees. They were interested in actually being outside in the winter. They didn't want to have an environment that was closed off in a whole city. They wanted to be able to negotiate it, which is a completely different approach to than the petroleum center in the middle of Seward Success at Point McKenzie, where it would have been a taller skyscraper than anything in Anchorage, um, which is like, even more odd when you think of like the the 64 quake in relationship to it they were just building up anchorage so fast and uh 
that futurism had just taken over the popular imagination that uh, they weren't taking into consideration the the actual environment. And Seward's success was also, uh, it, it's a privately owned city. It was, it was a city that was gonna be oil barons and those kind of people. So it, it would have been a very posh city that people wouldn't have wanted to be outside more than to do like the the skiing, the look of being skiing or whatever, would have had a very different effect. So, you know, within our theme of revised utopias, it really reached out to me, your project. Um, and I just really love this, you know, notion of creating these stories um, and kind of uh, constructed realities of being in these uh, uh, imaginative spaces that were um, created. I mean, that's a really strong project and I'm really glad we were able to fold you into this and I'm glad that uh, you've come along for the ride and been a really uh, big proponent of making sure that this happened tonight. So uh, really appreciate that. But I'm wondering like with revised utopias and taking it and transitioning from just you know, like a fictional creation uh, and story within these spaces, like what do you think that designers and artists and, and just overall good caring citizens of our city um, can, you know, what are lessons learned from these kind of dreamy exercises and utopian things and how do we move forward? What can we learn? Um, and that could be in a, a, a what to do or what not to do as well. What are your thoughts there? I, I have a lot of thoughts <laughs> <laughs> on that. Um, my, my first one would be as a new media artist. So I, I started making augmented reality. We, we called it locative media, media in grad school. Right as soon as we graduated, the iPhone came out, and about a year later, mobile augmented reality apps were actually available. Um, I have gone through so many iterations of projects because these apps don't exist for very long. Uh, the Exit Glacier project I did was for an app called Junio that we went defunct. I mean, that same app I used to do the Anchorage Centennial project. I mean, these are projects where like lots of money came in and I, I spent a lot of time building something and then it gets completely erased when an app just goes offline. Uh, all of these cities were put up in an app called Layar, which is completely gone now. Uh, I still have the models, so we're having to rebuild the apps, but augmented reality, or mobile augmented reality art making has taught me a lot about just adjusting and knowing that my artwork is not going to exist for a very long time. So you got to document it, um, which makes it even harder when you got to document it in situ in Alaska, where the Wi-Fi might not be available or it's horrible, or uh, you're getting weird glitches or you're watching your augments move with the shape of the earth away from where they're supposed to be. So you just kind of take it on the nose and it's part of the aesthetic of it. Um, my other side on the other one, and I think this is from working in the, the comic book version of these ways of thinking now, is that um, when you're designing something for a community, for a culture, wherever that community or culture is from, the, the more you're connected to that, the better everything is going to be that you make. Uh, so we could call this like indigenizing, but really this, this works in any system because it could be about biomes and not just anthromes. It could be any number of things, but when you connect at that level and you actually work with people that live there and have their input collaboratively work, that actually makes for a better idea. And when I think of something of like the notion of revising a utopia, um, a collaborative system in a, in a revision is invaluable. That's like the coolest part of that for me. And it's hard for a lot of people to accept that sort of loss of authorship or ownership of an idea, especially like a very creative one that you've put a lot of time into. But um, like in our comic books, uh, working with various storytellers um, or elders especially, 
the, you know, there's several different writers, but, um, you know, one of the characters is this Yanungan Iron Man kind of character, like a Yanungan billionaire. He doesn't have like a robot suit or anything, but every time that we were talking to an elder about the way the superhero should look in the comic books, he would say these amazingly uh, insightful things. Like, you know, the Yanungan people never invented shoes, so he should be a barefoot superhero. And we had actually already talked about the Yanungan people not having footwear as part of their normal thing. So it would be cool if his outfit just had him barefoot. But every time something like that happened, whatever the normal solution was, or uh, the, the, the collaborative answer when you're, you're having that kind of dialogue was always better than whatever I had come up with on my own. It was always richer, it was always better, and it always made a better story or set of images. Nice. So on that, I think um, I'd like to just ask anyone else if you have any further questions. We're coming up just past seven o'clock and um, I'd love to have a few more questions, but uh, we'll try and wrap things up here uh, in a little bit. And, and with that all being said, uh, Nathan, with your project uh, and your Creative Capital Award, can you elaborate a little bit about the Wintermoot project and that process and kind of what you're looking to do next. And, um, you know, one thing as well, for those of you that are in Alaska and uh, in Fairbanks and Juneau, um, you know, we do hope to have Nathan come and visit uh, these cities and be live in person and uh, kind of fill us in. And one thing that Nathan did mention is that uh, hopefully by that time in the fall, there will be new AR platforms so some of these spaces and different projects could actually be experienced, uh, which will be really fun for our audience. So uh, thank you for that. But yeah, if we could hear a little bit about this project and where you're headed next and what you're up to, I think everybody would really enjoy that. Uh, yeah, so w when we do eventually do this in the fall, we're gonna have uh, the Wintermoot app. Uh, and inside of Wintermoot, there's gonna be one of the features called Worlds of Wintermoot which is the three dome cities we just talked about, but we've also created, I think at this point, six other ones uh, that weren't part of that, but are part of this universe where dome cities had been built in Alaska and also their superheroes. So we published two of the books from Wintermoot. Every one of them uh, is centered around the relationship between two characters. So the first one was Ogpik and Mars Apple, and it was uh, a Nupiat cyberpunk story about this mother-daughter team of superheroes and it's got all the cyberpunk tropes of like simulations and space. Uh, the second one was called Sourdough and Arit. So there's a superhero, a white superhero named Sourdough and this amazing uh, Denina Atna superhero named Arit. And she's an anthropologist and he's a really old superhero that's kind of at the end of his days and she's interviewing him. Uh, but it expands like all these Alaskan superheroes. So we got a really deep you know, 2,000 years in the past, 2,000 years in the future. And this is book three that's going to be coming out in a little bit. It's actually going to be in two parts. Uh, this one's called Arete and Anthrom. Um, the really cool thing about this one that I'm loving is our main character, Arete, uh, is Denina Atna. So a lot of her speaking is in those terms, and she'll use a lot of Denina and Atna language and cultural references, but she's also, uh, she has autism. So a lot of her ways of thinking about the world are very contingent on a, uh, an autistic brain and how that uh, is. So this story, her and her husband, this handsome fellow here named Anthrom, are hunting for a supervillain that's hiding on a glacier and she's communicating with these ice worms to try to find out wherever he is. And then it expands and expands into a bigger story that ends up with a bunch of people stuck on the other side of the solar system. There's a whole bunch of magic. Um, so that kind of stuff. But uh, Wintermoot is a 10 part limited series. Um, so that we're gonna do basically 10 books, um, each of them having a different duo of characters that are together. And they're gonna tell a story that goes about 20,000 years into the past, into the younger Dryas, and then about 20,000 years into the future. So this is the first one in the series. This is the Ogpik and Mars Apple, all the cyberpunk stuff. So these all were augmented. So inside of here, when we're using like the Anupiton for stuff, 
the augments would translate that into English, the, the whole scope of it, all these little things here would get explained. And we just kind of had fun making this story and working with all these different people. So most of the characters inside of all of the Wintermoot comics were actually designed in collaboration with um, either another artist or another writer, and then uh, vetted through an elder process where they would give us information and we would come back. Uh, so this first one was just Inupiat. Uh The second one got a, a little bit into the Denina, but we were setting up the way uh, white folks lived in this universe at the same time. And then we got into the, the diversity of Anchorage on the same time. So, you know, for a lot of Alaskans, when they hear the word diversity, that's kind of code for an, uh, a destruction of indigenous culture in that area. So it, it's, it's a strange relationship. Um, but, you know, we have like Samoan and Filipino superheroes in the story that are being written in the same manner, uh, not so much with the language and uh, elder. Uh, system that we have with the um, Alaska Native folks that we're working with. Yeah, that's basically the project. They're all really long books. They come out once in the winter and once in the summer so far. And we'll go for 10. So that's five years of comic books. And then since these came out, a lot of other people have kind of found me. And some of these other folks that were making science fiction or comic books asked if I wanted to form a comic book company with them. And we did that last year. We've started getting grant money and things, but we've got, apart from the Winter Moot series, three other comic book series that are going to be coming out and uh, graphic novelization of the dirigibles of Denali science fiction. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, good luck on that. That sounds like exciting. It sounds like you have your hands full with that for sure. <laughs> good so, so we'll hope um, we'll hope things kind of transpire in, in the best way for everyone um, here in the next few months, you know, and we wish everyone the, the best of health. Uh, and we look forward to being able to have you travel around to the, the three cities and um, give us your lecture, hopefully, if everything pans out here. So with that, if there's any final, final comments, if you want to kind of wrap things up, uh, Nathan, we really, really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for participating. You can visit us at alaskadesignforum.org. You can check out our programming. And, uh, you know, thanks so much and really appreciate it, Nathan. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a super cool, super fun way to do this. Yeah, for sure. Well, with that, uh, we'll wish everyone a good night. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You guys take care.